Good morning. Oh my god. Like, the party was hard last night? Yes? No? You're still sleeping? You need coffee? How's it going? Oh my god. <laughs> so this was the end of my presentation. Uh, my name is Frederick Harper. Uh, I'm from Montreal. Uh, as I like to say, no relation with who you're thinking right now, please. <laughs> So I'm a senior technical evangelist at Mozilla. What does that mean? Uh, my role is to uh, give love to developers. So this is what I'm paid for. Um, I do the relationship between uh, the relation between developers, Mozilla, Mozilla and developers. Uh, my role is to do presentation and conferences and user group. It's to talk about technology, mostly web technology, even more focused with Firefox OS. Uh, a platform that you may not have heard that much in North America because it's not available in store, but uh, it's really for emergent markets, so this is my main focus. If you want to tweet during the presentation, please go ahead. Uh, I won't be upset. Please do use at F Harper. There is also, uh, I will put my slides and also the recording of my session on outofcomfortzone.net. This is my personal blog with blog posts in French, blog posts in English. And as you can notice, uh, blog post in Franklish. So uh, today's presentation is pretty interesting. Uh, first, I only had 45 minutes, like any other speakers. But I would be able to talk about optimizing application, doing, creating better application for days, for hours and hours. So that's going to be a really quick eye level on many, many tips and tricks that you can use to build your application, to build better application, to build mobile web applications that don't suck. We need to face the truth. I, I told you I'm uh, mostly working with developers who are building web application, targeting Firefox OS. And for those of you that don't know that platform, it's uh, like the OS right now is mostly available on low end devices. So devices that you can get for around $100. We also launched a device in India that you can get for three bucks. It's a smartphone. You can have application. There is a marketplace, of course. We created the subset of different application. We selected the application that can run on those devices. But what I saw by working with developers is that we need to get back to basic. We are used to a lot of things that are not true everywhere. And this is basically how uh, I came with that presentation. Get back to basic, trying to build better web application, trying to build better mobile web application, working in the browser, working on HTML platform. So of course, that presentation is not for you because we are all, it's not for us. We are all good developers. We're building great application. We're always giving the best experience to your users. There is some things that we may want to think about. One of the things that is probably one of my pet peeves uh, is that we're building for a specific platform. We are building native applications that work on iPhone, that work on Android, that work on Windows Phone. And we're forgetting people, users that have other phones out there. There is nothing more frustrating than there is a new application, there is a new services out there. I want to try it. Oh, sorry you don't have the right platform to use it. So it's why I really like web technology. Because I can access, I can create application that will be accessible on many, many platforms. Also, I think personally that we're coming back to an era, uh, an era where we are building applications for specific browsers using specific technologies. And that should not be the case. We also need to think about Something else in the desktop. In 2014, we still need to tell people that users, when they use your application, when they use your web application, it's not just on desktop anymore. It's not just on big screen anymore. When we think about devices that can access mobile web application, that can access web application, of course, it's on laptop, but it's on tablet. You know that kind of mix between tablet and, and smartphone. Uh, it's on tablet, it's on smartphone. I can access the web on my TV. I can access the web with my Xbox, with my PlayStation. I even have a browser in my Kindle. This is probably, is there someone from Kindle, from Amazon? 
Okay, this is probably the worst experience ever you're going to have in the browser, but still, <laughs> I can access the web. I can access web application on my Kindle. There is a browser there. So we tend to forget this. We tend to forget that there is other platform out there. There is people using feature phone. There is people using smartphone that may not be as powerful as the phone we have right now. In Toronto, in Canada, in North America, we're quite lucky. We can afford, or most people can afford those phones, $300, four, five, 1,000 bucks, without any contract, without anything. We may be able to afford those phones. Some people don't. Some people use older technologies. We need to think about those people. We want those people to be able to access their application. We want those people to be able to access their website. This is kind of a weird topic because I think we get screwed when it comes to internet in Canada. We pay too much. But at the same time, we have high-speed connection, either on our smartphone, on computer at home. I have really, really amazing connection, except when I go to an hotel. But at home, this is another thing. But I travel a lot for my work. I went to different countries, and I realized that we we're quite lucky. There's places where the internet connection is really, 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 really expensive and really, 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 really slow. And it's when it's working, because sometimes it's not working. I realized a couple of months ago that my website is super slow, is really slow. And I realized this at home with ISP uh, connection. And I was like, okay, someday when I'm going to have time, I'm going to optimize my website. I'm going to put some time on it. But when I went to India, I realized that my website is, is not slow. It's a dead end there. People cannot access it. It's super slow for those internet connection. And this is my fault. As a developer, I did a bad job. This is the fault of people that create those websites when I was trying to access those websites. The experience was not there. It was not an interesting experience. So I'm not a big fan of statistics, but I like to use this one. And, and no matter which kind of statistics you will look online about the number of devices we will have, 30 billions, 38 billions, 1,000 million, billions of dollars, I don't know, devices <coughs> out there, it will always be a big number. We're going to have a lot of devices connected to the internet really soon. It's happening right now in two, three, four years. And what's the common point of most of those devices? Web browser. If we remove the internet of things, if we remove the devices that are connected to the internet and those devices we don't have any interaction to do with, those devices, they have a web browser in common. So it's why it's important to create web application, web mobile application, but also create great application that will give a great experience. So to do this, we need to think differently. We need to change our, our way of working. So when we are building application that's going to work on mobile, web application that's going to work on mobile, there is usually three motivation for the users to access your application. Do you know them? you have an idea? It's not about getting a coffee to Starbucks. It's not the only way of using mobile application. <laughs> So the first one is I'm microtasking. I want to do something that I may be able to do on my desktop, on my laptop, on my tablet, but I want, I need to do it now. I receive, I don't know, an Excel spreadsheet from my manager. I need to modify something. I can do this on my phone. There is a way for me to do this on my phone. I'm local. I was talking about the Starbucks. I'm looking for a Starbucks because I need a coffee now. I'm in a city I don't know. I want to go to the restaurant. I want to find the best place near where I am to take the taxi or to take the bus or whatever. I am local. I'm bored. This presenter in front of me is doing a really shitty talk. Let's play some Angry Bird or any other games or let's go on Twitter, let's go on Facebook. There is many, many ways to just like use your phone to do exciting things and some of them is I'm bored. And those three things comes from a book called Tap Wordy. Uh, if you don't know it, it's, it's about iPhone. It's probably Josh wrote that book maybe, I think it's four or five, maybe six years ago. Still a really good book. Even if you're not building iPhone application, there is a lot of great uh, idea. There is a lot of great principle about designing great application. I don't know 
if you already got that experience. I don't know if you read that XKCD uh, comics, this one. But you know, I don't know the experience you had when you go to a university website. It seems that you never find the information you're looking for. And I don't know if there's people working at a university and building those websites. But yeah, you know what I mean. You're trying to access on the mobile, you can have different things. You're trying to access on the uh, web version, the desktop version, you can have different information. But all the things that you can always find that make sense is the full name of the school. After this, it's really hard to find the right information. And this is a problem, this is just a joke, but there is so many websites working like this. So there is something called mobile first. Do you know about it? Kind of ish. So uh, I won't take too much time to talk about like all the, uh, all what's including in mobile first. But actually what we tend to do still today is to start to build the desktop experience. I'm building a web application. I'm gonna make it work on my desktop. I'm gonna make it, make it work on the big screen I have. And if I have time, I may do a mobile experience. If I have time, I may create a second version of my website. Oh, I will have time, but it's gonna be at the end. I'm gonna think about mobile after my website, my web application is gonna work in the browser. But what we should do, and this is my own opinion, so feel free to criticize or not being happy with this, but I would think that we, we should go in the other way. We should think about mobile first. When we're going to design our application, we should think about the mobile first. We have some constraint, smaller screen. We don't have the same speed. It's not the same kind of hardware. So by thinking mobile first, I may, and there will probably a lot of chance that it will give a better experience to your user. Because after this, you're going to think about, hey, this is my experience on the mobile. This is what could be an experience on the tablet, what could be an experience on the desktop. But by starting by mobile first, by a mobile application, by an application that will work on the smartphone, that will help you to prioritize what kind of content. Actually, there is a philosophy about content first that could make sense also like this, thinking about the content before thinking about something else. So you think about what is the most important for your users. And after this, after you have more space, you're going to have more content. You're going to do those animation that may not or uh, that would not be super uh, exciting on the mobile. There's also something called responsive web design. And this is pretty interesting because usually those kind of goes together. It does not have to. You don't have to. But most of the time when we think about mobile first, we're going to think about responsive web design. And responsive web design. Uh, it's a term that had been coined by uh, Itan Marco a couple of years ago, and it's really about creating an experience that will adapt to different screen sizes. Actually, there is responsive web design, but there is also something else called the adaptive web design. And uh, if I come to, if I talk about the responsive web design, I will uh, explain adaptive web design after. There is three things you need to do when you're building your web application. You need a flexible grid layout. So forget about the fixed width. Think about percent. Think about using EM. You need flexible images and media. It's not quite there. Actually, you can use a max width of 100% on your images or on your video tag, and your video and images will adapt depending on the container size. But there is something that the W3C is working on called the picture element. And you're going to be able to provide different picture size depending on the screen size. And there is also something called media queries. So it's probably one of the best feature, my preferred feature in CSS3. It's kind of uh, having if statements in the CSS. So by using those three techniques <coughs> together, I'm going to make my site responsive. There is a lot of libraries out there like Bootstrap from Twitter that you can use to make the job for you. But by using those three techniques, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have one, web one website that's going to adapt to different screen sizes, different viewport. So instead of giving multiple experience, I'm going to give one experience that I'm going to adapt different, uh, depending on the website. So let me show you one quick example. Let's forget my agenda. So uh, there's a little P Bakery. This is an example coming from the uh, stunning CSS3 book. 
Uh, an old example, but pretty good to uh, show what I mean when I call uh, when I say responsive web design. So this is the kind of website you may create for your customer, for your client, and uh, some information about the bakery, a menu to the left, some pictures there. I have some information in the right sidebar, and it's a simple website, but that do the trick. So what's going to happen is that if I change the size of my uh, browser. And responsive web design is not about playing with your uh, browser size. Uh, there's also a tool in most of the browser, like in Firefox, if I go on Tool Web Developer, I have the responsive design, responsive design view that's going to help me to do this. But still, uh, it's easier to uh, just use like this. So if you watch the screen, oh, you don't see. Did you see the left? OK, sorry to move. So you're going to see the menu to the left at some point. When I'm going to be in the size of a tablet kind of ish, you're going to see the menu goes to the top because the designer decided that, hey, at some point I don't have much pace. Let's try to move the menu to, uh, to the top. And if I continue to scroll down, you're going to see that layout will change. So she decided to move the candies, to move the information, but it's still the same website. I have a different experience always with all the information that I need in my website. So this is one website, and what she did is that with those three techniques, the flexible grid layout, the image, uh, flexible image plus the media queries, she decided to change a little bit the layout to the website. So in that case, no matter if I'm on a mobile phone or on a desktop, I have a great experience. So how many of you already got that kind of super great experience when you go on your mobile phone and you have that mobile version of the site that doesn't give you that information that you're looking for? It's pretty frustrating. Like you need to be back at home or you need to find that link like desktop version or uh, sometimes you have like that full desktop version on your mobile. But you have to scroll in, scroll out, zoom in, zoom out. It's, it's really not interesting. It's not a great experience for me. And we're really quick right now to move from one service from one restaurant to the other. If I don't have the experience I need, if I don't find what I'm looking for, I will just go find the uh, store next door. So if I go look at the code, uh, what she did is not a really good thing. She put all the style sheet in line in the HTML, but this is mostly for the example, so don't do this at home, please can hurt. But there is normal CSS and at some point we're gonna see at some point media queries. So actually what she's doing right now she said that okay if the media type is screen so it's not a print it's on the screen and the min width is 1200 pixels please change the navigation move it to the top do some modification to the size of the text and she do this for a different screen size. So in her case, what she did, she basically managed three kind of screen size-ish. Like desktop, kind of tablet, and kind of smartphone. So you don't have to, you don't need to have a specific experience for different devices. But what she did is something that is working okay. And uh, I did the same thing for my website. Actually, if you go to outofcomfortzone.net, you're gonna see that I'm not managing all those devices out there. What I did is that I'm gonna have that kind of experience on the desktop, and if I go near a smartphone, I'm gonna change the experience. Between those two devices, you're gonna have an okay experience. That's not gonna be the best experience of your life, but it's gonna be way better than having that desktop experience. So this is one technique that we need to think about a little more. and. and when I'm doing presentation about responsive web design, some people come to me and say, Fred, we know this for years. No, like you know this for years. There are so many developers that don't know those techniques, and it's okay. There is no way for us to know everything, but still, we need to think about those things when we're going to build our application to give a better uh, experience to users. I was talking about internet connection. Some places, it's really expensive. It's not working super well. We tend to not design things working offline very well. And there is many ways for us to create offline application that will probably give a better experience to people. And even for us, if we are uh, having a really great data plan, it can go really fast. So uh, you can use the application cache. This is one way to cache your application uh, on the uh, client side. You can use local storage, but be careful because uh, when you're um, when you're using local storage, 
it's using the uh, file I/O and it can block the thread sometimes. So if you're doing too many, uh, using too often the local storage, that can be a problem. So you don't want to do this during uh, a game. Like if you're building a game and your player is, uh, is is trying to do something in your game and you're trying to save information, you can use IndexedDB. Uh, it's not there yet in all the browser, but most of the browser have a good support right now. And there is some platform, uh, of course, as an example, Firefox OS, you can use HTML, CSS, JavaScript to build those applications working on that platform. And if you create what we call the package app, so this is basically a zip file with all the files you need to run your application, you're going to have native uh, offline support for uh, your application uh, right out of your application when you submit your application. But there's also the UI and UX that is really important. You want to build a flight simulator application or any kind of application where, like, oh, there's so many options, so many features we can add to that application. And your application looks like this. Like, there's so many buttons and pattern and, 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 and like, this is overwhelming. This is nice. There's a lot of features in your application. But maybe, is it someone, like, doing the love? out there, is the compression sound. So uh, that can be a great experience, but maybe what your user need is this. Maybe you only need two options, takeoff and landing. We tend to try to use all the space we have. And what happens sometimes is that because we started with the desktop, we tend to try to fit everything we wanted to put in the desktop on the mobile application. But that's not the case. That's not something you may want to do, but maybe in some cases, this is the solution. Maybe you really need to do this. Maybe you really want to do this, but you really need to think about the UI and the user experience. Because if I'm looking for an application to solve one of my specific needs, and your application, the UI is not good, the experience is not good, even if your application is solving my problem, I may try to look for another application. I may just use the other application next to yours that have a beautiful UI, that give me a great experience. We are there right now. And we people in the room, we are tech savvy. We are able to understand those applications. We usually don't read the fucking manual. Sorry about that. We usually don't read the manual. But people do, some people do, some people have to. And you want to avoid those things. You want to give, you want to simplify the life of your users. But there is also what we call the comfort zone. When you're creating your application, think about the mobile experience that people will have. Think about it right now, people on your smartphone, trying to tweet or just read things during the presentation, how you hold your phone. There is that calm zone where it's easier for me to reach button, to reach information, to click in your application, to slide stuff in your application. We tend to forget those. We tend to forget those. There are so many applications I need to use my two hands. I'm not talking about a game. It makes sense for a game. But there are so many applications that could be changed just a little bit to give me a great experience. Think about when you go on Facebook. Where can you put your finger? Most of the time, you have to go to the status, status out there to write a status. I need to use my two hand. I don't think the design is really well done, in my own opinion. But at the same time, I suck at UI. I'm really not good. But I'm a user. I know what I like, I know what I don't like. So there is what we call that neutral tone zone. So think about that zone when you're creating an application. And it's the same thing for different devices. It's the same thing for tablet. Yes, tablet, you're going to use it with two ends, probably. But still, can you reach every part of the screen with your two ends if you, if you don't want to move? Let's be real. We're lazy people. People are lazy. They don't want to like move. They want to be comfortable when they use their phone, when you use your application. So think about this when you're going to build your application. There is something called the Fitz law. I'm really not good at maths. So what that means, it's basically that the bigger and closer a target is, the easier it is to hit. Captain obvious. But still, I should not have to say this, but and I'm including myself in it. When I'm building application, I tend to forget those things. How often will you use an application and you try to click the button and it's not working because you need to zoom it because it's, there is a bad design. 
or I really like those 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 kind of like websites or web application when like the unsubscribe is really near to subscribe or the delete account is near like change my username and, and you have trouble to click on the right one. I, I saw people laughing in the room. You get that bad experience. But we are building those bad experiences as developers. Not you, other developers. So we need to optimize. I'm laughing because I do I do all those things also. We need to optimize also our application. It's more than just the UI. It's more than talking about thinking about responsive and mobile first. We need to optimize our application. Uh, how many of you are doing webs for a couple of years now, creating web application? Kind of ish. So I don't know why, but a couple of years ago we were all about obfuscating. We wanted to obfuscate everything, and what that means that we wanted to uh, make our code kind of unreadable for other people. I don't know, it was a trend, we were doing this all the time, and after this people started to think a little more about open source and being more open, and we tend to forget those things. But actually, obfuscating your code is not just about like uh, hiding your code or trying to protect, protect what you did. I have um, that tool that I really like, it's from Google, it's Google Closure. Uh, it's basically doing a lot of things for you. It's doing some hosting, so joining variable, variable declaration, so you're gonna have less object, that's gonna speed up your process. They're gonna, they're gonna remove code that is unreachable, code that just don't do nothing in your application. It will obfuscate your code. And this is a good thing if you want to protect your code because it's gonna be harder for people to understand your logic. But that's gonna speed up the process because that's gonna be faster to execute. But more important, that's gonna be faster to download because that's gonna remove all the uh, spaces that's gonna rename variable like my counter, uh, my berries counter is gonna be like A or B or YC. So that's gonna be a little bit harder to read, but that's gonna reduce the file size and it's pretty good. So you can get a project on GitHub, it's running with Java, but also there is a closure compiler.appspot.com I'm just not quite sure if the last one is quite updated, so I prefer to use the one on my own computer. I always have the latest and the greatest coming from GitHub, but still, this is a really great tool. I really like uh, that tool. We tend to forget <laughs> that one of the part that's slow, or application, or at least that slow, the usage of our application, it's the HTTP request that we're making. Try to avoid or minimize 300 redirection because you're heading on the number of HTTP requests from your application. Try to use JSON uh, encoding on Apache, go play with HD access, on uh, IIS, go play with web config. That will change a lot. That means that that will add to the process time of your application because the browser will receive a compressed file, but it will have to uncompress those files, but still, what you're gonna to send to the user will be way smaller and it make a big, big change depending on the size of your website, depending on the size of your application, depending on the size of what you're trying to do. Try to use image sprites when it makes sense. Again, you're gonna reduce the number of HTTP connection when you're gonna do this. And now I see people looking at me as a Fred, are you starting to like do web programming for the last year? Like, are you new to programming? I told you, I'm working with a lot of developers, a lot of web developers, and they're good developers. They're really good developers. They're way better developers than me. Way, way better. But we're used to work with really good hardware. We're used to work with really good internet connection. And when I give a Firefox OS phone to someone, and they're a really good phone, really good OS, but still, there are phones that you can have for $100 without any contract, there are some developers who say, oh, your OS, your OS is really, really bad. And my answer is that, no, your application is really, really bad. I don't want to patronize, but sometimes, sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's about the hardware, but sometimes it's about how we build the application. And it's not, actually it's not true. It's not that the application is not good. It's that we're used to those super powerful devices. But we need to keep in mind that it's not a case. So those tricks are interesting. It may not apply to you. If your customers are only in Toronto and they can all afford those latest and greatest phones, good for you, fine. You have more flexibility when you're building your application. But those things really make sense. CDN, distribution network, it's really interesting. If your application is used in different countries, in different places, 
having a CDN will give the opportunity to people to get the data from local, uh, local cloud, maybe cloud computing or server or hosting provider. Use HTTP cache headers with Apache or HTTP expires response header with IIS. Uh, so that will use the caching uh, part of the browser uh, actually and the server will uh, send the content only when you uh, said that the cache will expire. So those are small tricks that you can use mostly on the server. I would say uh, the, the gzip and the uh, cache header that you can use on the, on the server side. But it's really interesting. It's usually the option you have on your shared hosting. If you have your own server, even if you are using Amazon or if you're using Microsoft Azure, you have access to those technology. We tend to forget about images. We are creating, we are creating amazing high resolution pictures with our phones. We created those super amazing picture with our SLR, but we tend to forget about images. They are creating, they're slowing your application depending on how we use them. Please stop like putting, not using native image resolution. I have that super beautiful pictures, but I know that in my application, I just wanted like 50 person. Use GIMP, use Photoshop, use any application giving you the opportunity to reduce the size of your, reduce the resolution of your image and put it on your website. Don't use with 850 person because um, the, all the application will be downloaded and will just be resized in the browser. That seems super simple. But so often, I'm going on a website, I like once in a while to go check the source code. I'm, all, I'm always surprised. And sometimes it's not the developer fault. Sometimes it's about the tool that people that are creating content use, WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, they have tools to resize images, sometimes not working, sometimes the way users use your website that you created, but think about this when you're gonna build your uh, CMS or when you're gonna install CMS for people. Use the right image format. PNG, PNG for images, JPEG for pictures. Try it at home. You will see the image, the image size will be very, very different. It can be a lot bigger if you're trying to use PNG for a photo. It can be a lot bigger if you're trying to use uh, JPEG for images. Those are simple tricks, but we tend to forget those. Use image preview for videos. Compress, compress your images. You can compress, you can, you can shrink your images. And I, I, do, do you know Flint Heard Long Gold? I don't even know how to, know to say that name. In French, it's Picsou. There's no people old enough, maybe. Okay. So this guy just wanted all, like, all the money and was really cheap. So be cheap with your images, but give, like, don't optimize by losing quality. And there is a couple of tools. So those are three free tools. I tried uh, two of them. Uh, I'm using uh, Image Optim on OS X. It's doing a, a pretty good job. And maybe it's too much optimizing for you. But think about this. I tried with two images I had that I put on my blog. And I saved 22% of one of that images. Think about having 100 images, 1,000 images. That make a difference for the users. That make a difference for the data that will go into two from your site, from your application, to the users. And that will make surely a difference on mobile devices. There is also Trimage on Linux and PN PNG Gauntlet that is doing amazing thing on Windows, probably one of the best I saw. Uh, those are all free uh, and uh, they're pretty good. But you need to be careful because what we do with those applications, we reduce, we compress those images. But at some point, browser need to render those images. So you're going to sacrifice rendering time for data that will uh, go on the web. So as an example, if I have a solid black texture size, kind of big texture that I'm going to use in my application, if I compress that file, I may get something like 5 kilobytes of PNG file. Pretty small for that big pictures. Once that's going to be on the browser side, on the client side, guess what? To show that images, the browser need to uncompress the images. And you may, you may come to with 8 megabyte pictures. Think about it. It's, it's four, uh, 4 byte pi pixels because there's like the RGB and the alpha channel. So all 
together, you're going to come back with an image of 8 megs. So in that time, what are you going to do? You're going to have the process time, you're going to use memory. So depending on what you're trying to do, that may be an answer, that may not be an answer. So keep this in mind. Those are small tips and tricks. Avoid plugging usage. I'll say it again. Avoid plugging usage as much as you can. So if there is Flash developer, Silver Light developer, Java developer, like Applet, all those things, you're not going to be able to reach everybody if you use plugins or some plugins that are not working in different devices. Usually it's slower. Usually you have to download some packages. You have to install some more stuff. It's okay to build only using HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We are at a time right now where the technology is there for us, where HTML is good enough for us, developer, to build great application for a user, to easily build great application for a user. Load the JavaScript file at the end of the page. You will not block the thread. It's pretty good for me if I have access to the interface and you're still loading the JavaScript file. It's OK. If I want to access to your uh, application and all the files are loading at the beginning, sometimes you're uh, loading file directly from Google, sometimes you're loading file uh, directly from the jQuery, CDN. Uh, usually it's fast, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you have your own file, JavaScript will be executed. If you don't have to, load the files at the end of the page. Or you can also use async. So when it's possible, load your JavaScript file asynchronously. So those will be executed asynchronously, but this is a good technique. You just have to uh, add the async uh, keyword when it's possible. And this one, it's kind of, yeah, JSON is faster than XML most of the time. It's faster to render, it's faster to uh, use. Uh, of course, you won't have the same super solid structure you may have with XML, so sometimes it's better for you to use XMLs. But if you don't know, if you want to choose one, if you want something faster, usually JSON will be faster to use. And this is a pet peeve of mine. But you don't always need a framework or a library. I see some web application using jQuery for nothing. It's pretty cool using jQuery. But you may not have to. Vanilla HTML, CSS, JavaScript, HTML could be good enough, depending on what you have to do. Because when you're going to use those frameworks, when you're going to use those libraries, you're going to load more stuff. You're going to download more stuff for the user. That may slow down your application. That may slow down the experience of your users. There's other micro-optimization you can do in your application. And I tell you, this is a really quick eye level of some of the tricks you can have. Uh, if you have large background image, uh, actually, it's not true. If you uh, have like uh, a background, you're doing a game, and uh, you have something that you don't need to refresh quite often, what you can use that you can use in a div a CSS background that you put under your canvas instead of putting the background directly on the canvas. That will stop the process to always refresh your uh, background. So this is good for things you don't have to refresh. It's good also if you have different part of your game. I'm always talking about games when I'm talking about canvas because this is where, it's, uh, where people use canvas the most. And it's also where uh, you can have a really, you can have trouble with, uh, with the CPU, you can have trouble with the memory you use, you can have trouble also with the GPU you're using. So you can use multiple canvases with different layer. I have a part of my game that is updated every 30 seconds, one minute. I can have a specific canvas from that part and having my principal my people in my game, my principal, my car, my, my teams in my game that is updating quite often in a different canvas. Don't scale images in dry image. You can cache doing this in an off-screen canvas. You will probably uh, speed up the process. Again, if it's only like an application, kind of line of business application, you may not want to use those tricks. Those are mostly for, I would say, gaming, where you need a lot of like uh, refresh rate. You need a good refresh rate. By using uh, offline canvas, uh, off-screen canvas, that could help you a lot uh, creating different uh, applications. And depending on which platform you want to support, depending on uh, exactly 
uh, on which browser, on which platform, I would suggest to use WebGL uh, instead of Context 2D because you can do 2D with WebGL. And if it's supported by your platform, you, what you, what's going to happen is that it may be a little more complex to use WebGL if you don't know that technology. But what you're going to do is that you're going to free up some CPU because WebGL is going to use the GPU, the graphical uh, process unit. So those are small tricks. Avoid creating new object when it's possible. Because I'm not talking about more memory optimization right now. I have a full presentation about it. But what you can do is that, uh, well, not what you can do, but every time you're creating object, think about there is at some point the garbage collector. There is at some point the process that will need to free up those objects. So if there is a way for you to still have a great code by optimizing what you're trying to do, uh, I'm not talking about like creating one object and always using this. There are some people that uh, talk about using a pool of objects, like four or five, an array of objects that you're going to reuse to your stuff. That may make your code unreadable, uh, really hard to uh, maintain. But still, there is some ways at some point to uh, make it uh, easier. I don't know how much that. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty good. So in the end, there's a tool, another tool, I'm not working for Google, but you need to admit that I have good tools. Uh, there is the Google uh, Developer PageSpeed Insights. Really interesting. Really interesting. It's free. Uh, you paste your uh, you paste your link of your application, uh, web application. They're gonna give you some score. Don't go crazy with the score, but really look at the warning. Really look at the error. And this is what my website was giving. Uh, still giving because I didn't have the time to fix what I wanted to fix. Uh, 61 on 100 on the mobile version. They're going to try a desktop version. Uh, they're going to, they're going to, like, they're going to give you some tips that I had in the presentation, but other tips. And those are usually quick to fix and will improve a lot the uh, page speed, will improve a lot the loading speed of your application. And I'm not an SEO expert. But from what I know is that if your web page is pretty slow, uh, that's not going to be good for Google and, and other search engines. They're looking for really like uh, pages that, that go faster, that go fast. And I think under like two seconds of respawn time, uh, it's really not good. It's really not giving a, a good experience. And we are at that time right now. We're wanting really fast. We're wanting that goes really quick. JSPerf is your friend, if you don't know. Uh, it's kind of an ugly website, but it's doing what you have to do. Uh, if you want to, if you don't know, you want to optimize something, you don't really know what's happening, you can do testing. JetFirst will run those tests for you, will give you some, uh, some uh, percentage about the running time, about the fact that this technique or this uh, function is faster than the other one. It's a really good website. Of course, it's work for Mozilla using Firefox. There's a Firefox developer, developer tool. Uh, pretty good, I'm not talking about Firebug. But you have also great tools in Chrome, you have also great tools in the browser you use. Probably most of the browser are really, they have really great developer tools. But I really like the job that our uh, engineers did uh, for the developer tools. There is basically uh, the two, probably tool that you may want to use the most if you want to optimize your application is the profiler. So you're gonna see where your application is taking time, maybe too much time, and the network tool where you're gonna see, hey, what's happening? Where the file is downloading? How much time it takes? How many HTTP connection I have? How many files I have? To do this, I tried on, uh, if I go back to the developer tool, uh, when I was testing on my website that was working on WordPress, what I did is that now I'm trying uh, Jekyll. I don't know if you know, but it's basically a website generator. So I'm gonna generate my blog, generate static, static HTML JavaScript CSS file and that changed everything. My website is so super fast and what I do is that by using some plugin in Jekyll, what I do is that I combine all the CSS file in one, all the JavaScript file in one. My code is still good but when it's go on the website, if you go check view source, you're going to freak out. But that's going to be really fast. So this is another way for me and I saw this by using network networking tool. I saw this with the Google PageSpeed, so it was pretty interesting. Try on low-end devices. I'm not trying to sell you Firefox devices, but 
you can buy two devices in Canada in the, uh, on the web, Firefox OS Claim, the ZDE Open. And uh, basically, when you test your web application on those devices, you have a great idea on how your application is working. As I said, the OS is pretty good, but still, by testing on those devices, you're going to know how it's run. So I'm done. I will just finish with my philosophy of the day, because we're, what day we're, Thursday morning. So uh, as a developer, don't make us think about the interface. I don't want to learn how your application is working. I want to use your application. Deal with complex, complex, complex tasks for us. Insulate us from those tasks. I want to be able to do my stuff, what I have to do with your application, without any complexity. I told you I'm lazy. I'm not the only one. I'm on my mobile phone. I have probably that, this, or maybe with the iPhone 6, I have this. But still, I don't have that much space. It's not the same space as I have on the desktop. Make me accomplish my goal easier. It's basically the two first point. And make me awesome. I want to feel awesome. I want to be awesome. I want to be the star of your application when I use your uh, mobile application. So think about those things. I'm running out of time. I know the best. The next presenter is pretty good from me. He's going to do an introduction on Node.js. But if you still have questions, I'm going to be there during the break. Feel free to send me an email, frp.mozilla.com. I answer all the email. It may take some time, but I answer all the email. Always Twitter. Uh, if we talk in person, Facebook, and me on LinkedIn. If you like technical blog posts, go to axe.mozilla.org. Uh, really good technical blog posts around HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and all everything we do at Mozilla. And last but not least, outofcomfortzone.net. I'm going to put the slides online. I'm also going to put a recording of my presentation. So. That was a really quick 45 minutes. It's not enough. I hope you will still be hungry to learn more about how you want to optimize your application, how you want to create better application, application that don't sucks. I'm thinking about maybe doing some blog posts about those. So if you have other tips and tricks, let me know. Send me an email, and I'm going to try to build something bigger because this is only the, uh, the point of the iceberg. So thanks a lot. Have a great uh, rest of the day and really, really nice conference. <laughs>